one of the consequences of growing old is that you, if you're around for a long while, you tend to get things named after you. Uh, and uh, tonight brings together two things named after me, uh, of which I'm inordinately proud. Uh, the uh, lecture that is sponsored by the ANU and um, the uh, chair that uh, Anne Orford, our lecturer, uh, has um, uh, accepted and uh, which does me great honour. Um, I've also had other things named after me. I've had dogs <laughs> and cats and even human children. Uh, but uh, tonight is a special night for me, uh, and I uh, want to express particular thanks to Anne Orford for a wonderful lecture. It wasn't, uh, as you will have noticed, something that was simple, uh, straightforward, and uh, that can be comprehended easily if it's something that is new to you. Uh, I became involved in the HIV pandemic, because it was a pandemic before the COVID pandemic, uh, as a result of a visit to Australia of a very great international civil servant, Jonathan Mann. Um, he later was appointed to be the first director of the uh, Global uh, Commission on AIDS and the Global Program on AIDS, GPA. Uh, and for that purpose, he was taken from Brazzaville in French Congo up to Geneva and he worked there and he came out to Australia. Uh, and with a number of professors, I was invited to a dinner with him and I met him and that led later I think because I held a judicial title, I think that was the bait that made Jonathan Mann think, well, we'd better have somebody terribly respectable on this uh, pandemic because it was a pandemic that involved a lot of very vulnerable people, uh, uh, men who have sex with men, uh, sex workers, injecting drug users, prisoners, uh, people who... Um, presented real difficulties in getting an international response. And the result of the work of the Global Commission on AIDS uh, and of the other activities of Jonathan Mann before he had a bust up with Mr Nakajima, the Director General of, uh, of the World Health Organization, uh, the net result of it was that a recommendation was made to the global community at a time when there were no curative drugs, that the only thing we can do is to reach out to the affected populations, remove the laws against them, and try in that way to encourage them to take our advice and do certain things and protect themselves and thereby protect the whole community. Only two countries immediately followed that. The first was New Zealand. They're a feisty little country, New Zealand, but they often do things first. They're wonderful, including on nuclear weapon, uh, weapons and controls. Uh, they're leaders. We have rather tended to drag the chain. Uh, but the result of the effort was that UNDP, the United Nations Development Program, uh, set up an inquiry uh, to which I was appointed, uh, which sought to look at uh, the law as it affected the pandemic of HIV AIDS. And it found things uh, where the law was a real impediment, such as the law on homosexuals, the law on sex workers, the law on drugs and so on. Um, but it also found that there was an area of the law little considered by most people who are in the HIV field, which was extremely important. 
and that was the law of intellectual property. Because although the Global Commission was established in 1989, um, and I was appointed to it then, uh, the development of the antiretroviral drugs with the so-called triple combination therapy, they found that if they mixed up these drugs that had been uh, developed for other purposes and combined the three major drugs, that that would have not a curative effect, because we've never found a cure for HIV, but a greatly palliative effect so that people could live their lives without risk to others and without risk to themselves. This was treatment uh, effectively as control, and it was extremely important. But as the antiretroviral retroviral drugs became really important, uh, intellectual property law uh, and the TRIPS agreement became important in tandem. And when the original triple combination therapy came along, um, to get access to the triple combination therapy, uh, the original prices were about $1,000 a year. And most people in the developing countries talk about a racial discrimination in international law and international um, politics, uh, could not pay that. And two countries in particular couldn't pay it, uh, but they did have sufficient uh, skill, scientific skill and manufacturing skill to be able to deconstruct the drugs, find out what they were made of and reproduce them. Uh, and those two countries were India and Brazil, very big countries, very big HIV pandemic uh, and constitutional requirements that obliged their government to look after the health of their people. Uh, and uh, they said, we are going to do this. The result of that was, on the front page of the New York Times, was a scoffing remark by the then American uh, president and the then officials that there's no way, in, with all respect to India and Brazil, uh, that they could do it. But Brazil had a very feisty president, Lula. He's a candidate to come back now. <laughs> uh, and he said, we are going to send first class tickets to take the leaders of the American industry and manufacturers of the drugs to come down and see our country, to come along and see our laboratories. And then they can talk about whether we can do this or not. And Lo and behold, the, the manufacturers and representatives of government went down there and to their amazement, they concluded that this could be done by Brazil and by India and by other countries. Now, under a lot of pressure, India later changed its intellectual property law, which made it difficult for them to do this. Pressure is the name of the game. And the net result of this was that in India, before they changed their intellectual property law, the price of uh, getting access to the intellectual, the uh, triple combination therapy, came down from $1,000 a year down to about 100, and then even lower and smaller, and they could afford it. And that turned their epidemic round, likewise in Brazil. And this demonstrated the unfairness of the, uh, of the TRIPS agreement and of the way in which uh, Section 301 was used to put countries on the blacklist. And that has immediate bad consequences for those countries. The net result of it is if you're on the US blacklist, you, your trade with that country, is, uh, with the United States, is really undermined. And so it's not just a theoretical thing, it's something really urgent, important and immediate. Uh, 
Um, but uh, everybody then got in on the act. Uh, the Global Fund on AIDS, malaria and tuberculosis, uh, uh, UN AIDS, uh, UNDP, uh, everybody started to look at this. And in a report to which I contributed for UNDP, we said the Secretary General should set up a body, uh, an interdisciplinary body, to find solutions that can be incorporated into the TRIPS agreement uh, and can help countries under that agreement, the TRIPS agreement, to um, uh, make their own drugs in the event of a national health emergency. Not an unreasonable idea. And so we had our meetings, we delivered a report, we had a wonderful committee. Uh, it wasn't specifically a WHO committee, it was a UNDP committee, development. And uh, the chair of the committee was uh, Ruth Dreyfus, who had been the president of the Swiss Confederation and also the president, uh, the, 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 the co-chair the, had been the president of Botswana. Uh, and they were magnificent leaders and they urged that steps should be taken to modify the TRIPS agreement uh, and that led to recommendations to the Secretary General uh, and that is where it was left when Ban Ki-moon demitted office. Now Ban Ki-moon was a very unusual man. He was a Korean diplomat but when he got into the office of Secretary General, he really flourished. Uh, and uh, he um, appointed, or he, he knew, and I took part in the inquiry into North Korea, and that is something on the minds of every South Korean. And a moment happened one day in the UN headquarters in Geneva. This would have been about 2000 and and 15 or 13 maybe, when I was going up an escalator and Gareth Evans was coming down an escalator, uh, not Gareth Evans, uh, and James Crawford was coming down an escalator. James Crawford was being taken around to be inspected for consideration for election to the World Court. And I went up the escalator and I said, hello James, and he said, hello, Michael, good to see you. And he went up to fame and fortune as a judge of the World Court, sadly to be struck down later. I went up in the lift to the top floor of that building, that great graceful building at the foot of 42nd Street, which is where the Secretary General's office is. And uh, I was ushered into the presence and then somebody came in to take photos, which are very regular. They've got the UN wonderful logo and the map of the world and so on. And uh, I went forward with Ruth Dreyfus uh, and with uh, the president of Botswana. And uh, I went forward because I had been the chair of the advisory technical committee. With that, people leapt forward to drag me out of the photo because this was only for presidents and not a mere judge from Australia. But the Secretary General came to the rescue because he knew me from the North Korea inquiry and he pulled me back. It was somebody official was pulling me this way and pulling me that way. But I went back into the uh, photograph and lo and behold, that is how we appear on that occasion. But um, uh, as Anne has explained in her lecture, there was then another pandemic and that other pandemic demonstrated more urgently and immediately the real problem of having drugs uh, and tests and therapies uh, which are the subject of uh, intellectual property, which countries will seek to enforce. Section 301 will seek to enforce, uh, and uh, that is where we are in the world now. And that's why the issue that Anne has explored tonight um, 
is so important and so urgent. And I remember that the Australian government, at a meeting I went to here in Canberra, was very proud of the Australian contribution to the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. And somebody said recently, I think it was somebody in the then opposition, now the government, that the coalition had mucked up the trans, we should fix that up and join the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. Well, I'm with Anne, I think that would be a very bad thing because that's still more ammunition to try to prevent countries fulfilling their own constitutional and moral duties to protect their own citizens uh, in cases of desperate international global uh, health crises. So, boy, we've had a wonderful lecture tonight and it's been on a subject which is right up there as one of the really big moral questions of the day. What are they? Nuclear weapons, unless we control that, unless international law can come to our rescue, it can all be over quickly. And if, if you've been watching Al Jazeera and other news on Mr Trump smashing uh, the ketchup on the wall, this is the man who has his finger on the nuclear buttons. I mean, this is a terrible, shocking and urgent thing. So that's the first. The second is global climate change. And the third, I think, is uh, pandemics, because we haven't seen the end of COVID and we haven't seen the end of pandemics. So I want to thank Anne for a really topical, uh, technical, detailed uh, lecture which will repay careful study and I hope will get into the hands of the many very distinguished representatives of the Commonwealth of Australia and the bureaucracy of our country so that they will get it, read it and inwardly digest it and lay off trying to get us to sign the Trans-Pacific Partnership and lay on to us being a leader, like New Zealand often is, uh, in the sorts of steps that Anne has suggested in her wonderful lecture. We should give her, as citizens of Australia, a really a big round of applause for such a wonderful lecture, appealing to us as Australians for once to be a leader in a great moral issue uh, and a great legal issue. Thank you very much, Anne Orford.